Do you love spy books, movies, and TV? Then the Spyberry Podcast is for you. Hello and welcome to Spybury, episode 231. Welcome to Station V. Today we've got a 90-minute special for you. We are chatting with Mr. Nicholas Shakespeare, who is the latest biographer of the creator of James Bond, Ian Fleming. Now, I thought what would be really cool is to recruit a couple of Fleming Bond experts. In fact, the two gentlemen we invited on to today's Spybury are probably the most knowledgeable people I know personally about Fleming and James Bond. We welcome to the show Jeremy Dunn's author of both fiction, love the Paul Dark series. Write more, Jeremy. Um, he also writes nonfiction. He's written blog posts, ebooks about Fleming, a true scholar. We're also joined by AJ Chowdhury. Many of you know AJ. He's an author, he's been involved in movies. He's the spokesperson for the James Bond International Fan Club. And these, these two really know their stuff when it comes to Fleming. And I gave them a task. I said, chat with Mr. Shakespeare, because many of us want to know what's new. Is there anything new in the latest biography? Because many of us have read the previous biographies and we all have to be read piles that are like the Leaning Tower of Pizza, right? We're all big readers here. So uh, you're really going to enjoy this 90 minute episode, this conversation with Nicholas Shakespeare. Just one favor, please. If you enjoyed today's episode, hit the like button. Better still, if you hit subscribe, then you're gonna get all of our content. Many of you have asked for more of these video style interviews from Spybury. I'm happy to do it. It is more of an investment. Um, so a like really does mean a lot to us uh, and also hitting that subscribe button. So without further ado, let's cross over to Jeremy, AJ, and Nicholas Shakespeare on Spybury. We are delighted to have today with us Nicholas Shakespeare, who is an acclaimed journalist, a novelist, and biographer. And he is most recently the author of Ian Fleming, The Complete Man, a new and very exciting biography of the creator of James Bond. Welcome, Nicholas. Thank you so much for being here. Very nice to be invited. Um, Thank you for agreeing to be interrogated by us. And the first thing we want to say was congratulations on the book. It's a tremendous achievement. Um, it adds an enormous amount of detail and texture and nuance uh, to a story that we felt we knew already, but apparently didn't. Every, every, every page, every citation, every source, everything you've written moves the needle, needle forward. And if we may say, uh, your writing is so beautiful as well. It sits very well on the page and in the eye, and that's another achievement as well, but such a rich, heavy book. So you've you've achieved on all sorts of levels. And yes, and we've read everything going and it's a it's a quadruple achievement when you look at it in the context. It's a little bit like writing about the Beatles. What more is there to write? And you sort of mark Lewis on this this book. It's it's perfect. Uh, we were we were wondering if you could just if you could just sort of set it up a little bit um, to say how this yeah. happened because you're a novelist how did how did you get approached what was the idea behind it bit about well, your background i i'm a novelist before i'm a biographer and i'm speaking to you from my own golden eye which is <laughs> a small bungalow a beach shack in tasmania right at the other end of the earth where i have come for about 25 years and have written part of nine books here and i was Five years ago, I'd started a novel in this house, and literally five years ago, I think almost to the same day, I get a call from my agent in England to say, we've got rather an interesting proposition for you. Um, the Fleming estate would like you to consider writing a new authorised biography of Ian Fleming. It would be the first bi authorised biography since 1966. And uh, would you be interested? And... I confess that my first reaction was hesitation because I wasn't necessarily a fully paid up member of the James Bond fan club or Ian Fleming fan club. I didn't, I'd read, of course, all the Bond books feverishly as a schoolboy, as, as you both had. Um, but I, I hadn't really got a particularly uh, firm picture of Fleming. I'd written a book previously, a non-fiction book about the Norway campaign in 1940 and Churchill coming to power then. And 
I had contacted the Fleming estate to get hold of their private papers of Peter Fleming, who was the first kind of British officer to land in continental Europe during the Second World War in April 1940, when he went up to Norway as a kind of pre-commando before the commandos existed. And uh, I think the family must, I imagine, have liked how I dealt with their the, the material they gave me. And But what I'd had sideways glimpses when I very much admired Peter Fleming's um, activities and achievements, I'd only kind of glanced sideways at Ian Fleming and, and the... I have to say that the image I got of him was a slight caricature and a, a kind of tabloid, not very attractive picture. And it struck me only very recently that the moral of Ian Fleming's story, or one of them, is don't run off with the wife of the owner of the Daily Mail if you wish to avoid forever after being rendered into tabloid fat. Because... <laughs> The image I had was, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I don't need to rehearse it to you, but essentially it was of a kind of sardonic bounder, somebody who hadn't been very important in the war. He'd been in charge of in trays, out trays and ash trays, somebody yes. said. And that I had a picture of this kind of rather arrogant Old Etonian uh, coming back at night from his golf club or his... His, his London club, speeding in his car, getting back to his house in Victoria Square, coming up the stairs past his wife's posh guests, these intellectuals she liked to attract around her, kind of waving them rather airily as he went up to his monastic top floor bedroom and pulling the sheets over his head, trying not to listen to their sniggers below while they anatomized his latest book. I mean, that was the image I had. So I, I thought, do I really want to spend, you know, what would probably be four or five years in the company of a cad and a bounder? So I asked the Fleming estate, I said, look, very, I'm very flattered. Very, it's a very exciting project. Um, can I have kind of, can I do some due diligence on this? Um, so I was given two months to kind of go around and uh, and look at the material they could offer me and see one or two people who had known Fleming. Not that many are alive, family. I mean, although he died in 1964, very, very few people seem around from his generation, many of whom, you know, because of the war, had died young like him. I mean, he died age 56. But th he didn't have very many contemporaries alive and not that many people who I could get firsthand kind of memories for, you know, that, who would serve like a lightning rod back into his past. So I looked at some of the material the Fleming family gave me. I saw one or two people like his stepdaughter, Fiona Morgan. Mm -hmm. I talked to Kate and Lucy, his, his, his nieces. And bit by bit, what kind of I discovered was that he, there were two things I discovered he was both a much kinder person than I'd imagined. I mean, every reference to him from the women he'd had affairs with seemed to mention the word kindness or kindliness. And this wasn't some, some a quality I'd associated with James Bond. And the men, too, who he'd known, he had a kind of group of old Etonians who'd been at school with him, and he kept loyal to them right up to the end of his life. They weren't perhaps the most exciting people, but each one of them, by, except with one or two exceptions like Ivor Bryce, were kind of totally upright people who would never have spent time with a cad. So both men and women were really attracted to him in a loyal way, and they, they, the women continued to, to be in love with him long after their affairs had ended. I mean, there's a wonderful um, unpublished diary by Maud Russell, the woman he'd had an affair with during the war who had, who had actually bought him Goldeneye after the war. She, I got to know her niece, Emily, who lives in Chile. And she, after quite a lot of um, persuasion, allowed me to see the unpublished diaries of Maud Russell, her grandmother. And there was a reference in that, seven years after Ian Fleming 
died, in which Maud Russell says, I think of Ian constantly, I think of his gentleness and his tenderness and above all his kindness. And so, as I, I repeat, kindness was not an association I, I, I'd made with him. And it's also a very, very prized quality for a biographer to discover. Right. The second thing I discovered was that instead of outtrays and ashtrays, he was actually a far more significant figure in the Second World War than hitherto I'd imagined. And uh, the, the danger with his, his reputation is that either people decide that, you know, he was like Bond and uh, did everything. I mean, there was one wonderful book by a man called James Creighton, who claimed to be a, a spy, who, who said that he'd known Fleming and he kayaked up to Berlin and he'd rescued Bormann from the bunker and he'd also rescued Hitler from the bunker. But as he was coming away from the bunker, a Russian shell blew Hitler's head off. And so you, you've got all these extreme claims for Fleming as the kind of superhero a la Bond or a le Bond. And then you had people who, who just, just dismissed him as a kind of chocolate sailor. And the truth kind of wove zigzag between these two extremes. I mean, it's very difficult to find out what his wartime uh, duties were. I mean, perhaps we'll come on to this, this later, but it, it, it seemed that absolutely he had fingers in almost every single intelligence pie, which he could do in naval intelligence, because unlike army intelligence and air force intelligence, the Navy was in operation from day one of the war. And so he, as the person assistant to Admiral Godfrey, the director of naval intelligence, once he'd got Godfrey's trust, basically he represented Godfrey and acted as Godfrey in all these different, as I say, pies, whether it was propaganda unit with Sefton Delma, who he employed, whether it was in topographical unit with Robert Harling, who Fleming also employed, whether it was in 30 AU, the unit that Fleming himself set up to try and get when they went in with the first waves of the troops to try and grab any ciphers or Enigma machines in North Africa and Italy and in and the rest of the, the field of operations, you know, an incredibly important unit, which in a sense could be argued helped shorten the war by 18 months. Some of the, the great triumphs that Fleming's commandos achieved in getting Enigma machines and cipher books and some of the top secrets later on in the war from, from the German, from either the German naval archives or in some of the scientific discoveries they'd made in which Fleming commandos brought back to England. But anyway, and so, so there was the field of operations in Europe that he was involved with, but then there was his involvement in helping set up the first foreign in American intelligence organization, you know, just at a time when we were trying to persuade neutral America to get into the war, Fleming was one of a, a handful of trusted officers who were in the room when these decisions were being made, and in the room, Fleming himself, when the kind of prototype of the first intelligence American organization was set up, he Fleming helped in Washington with, with William Donovan, to model it on naval intelligence in Britain. And, you know, Fleming, it's, it's, Fleming's one of two or three people there doing that. And, you know, this became, after the war in 1947, the CIA. So when we talk of the special relationship, which was essentially an intelligence relationship, Fleming was one of those people absolutely at the, 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 the first prong of it. And so... And in 1945, Fleming, I discovered, is one of those with his brother Peter, uh, who, who are contributing ideas to what America, what British intelligence is going to look like after the war. And Fleming contributes to the Bland Report with suggestions, which include, astonishingly, you know, he anticipates drones, he anticipates cyber warfare. And he makes the one thing he doesn't anticipate is that China would have an important navy. But basically, where he looks at the hot spots in the world post-war, they've all come to be quite accurately predicted by him. And it's clear that 
1945, he was he was chairing joint intelligence bureau um, committees, and he was sometimes chairing joint intelligence committee meetings. This is fantastically. Uh, this isn't a, a man chucking away ashtrays, as you know, one or two people yeah. like Max Hastings still are resistant to believing that Fleming was important. I mean, you, you you don't chair a JIC meeting if if you're basically a, a kind of uh, unimportant. And nobody, yeah. yeah. And so well, what was clear is that at the end of the war, he is set, helping to set up, contributing to what British intelligence will look like after the war. And he is then offered in August 1945 an important job in this. We don't know what it was. But it's very likely it would have led to him probably becoming the head of SIS. I know in 1952 or three, his brother Peter was one of shortlisted for five to be considered for the head of SIS. But I think it's ironic that Fleming, had he continued in naval intelligence, it could have been he himself who was um, C, as, as, as it was called. Um, he, he, he doesn't. He decides in that moment in, in August 1945, to kind of veer into back his first love, which was journalism. He'd been in Reuters in 1932, 33, which he absolutely loved. And he was a very, very good correspondent in Moscow covering the, the Stalin trials there. And I think he, he wanted, he always had a kind of wish to be a newspaper proprietor. And he, although the, the two people in the war he played bridge with, Lord Rothermere, and uh, Lord Kemsley, you know, those two people were newspaper uh, magnates and they too divvied up Reuters between them after the war. And I think Fleming always had a hankering himself to, to go back to Reuters as a kind of manager. And Kemsley, when he offers him a job in 1945, is offering really Fleming the, the possibility of becoming his own kind of head of Reuters within the Sunday Times. So he's offered the job of foreign manager to be in charge of about 88 journalists around the world, many of whom are spy, former spies, some of whom he recruits from naval intelligence. And in a sense, he's trying to kind of re reactivate his own naval intelligence experience, but in a, in a Cold War setting now. And what it struck me as when, when I was looking at how Bond evolved, it struck me that Bond was the person that Fleming would have been had he stayed on in in intelligence. So he, he, he explores the route he might have taken had he joined, uh, continued in intelligence in 1945 and um, in, in a Cold War setting. So he, he puts all the operations that he'd set up in, in the Second World War against the Nazis, many of them which you know had to be shelved because they were too dangerous or ludicrous, he then brings them out of cold storage and he puts them into fiction and he puts them against the Russian enemy now. So uh, anyway, all of that meant that um, I thought, yes, this is a rather exciting project. And um, so we, uh, as I, to recap, he was both kinder and more significant than I'd imagined. Now, th there was a third thing. Writers are very superstitious. I'm sure you both would appreciate how superstitious we are. We're, we're, we're both incredibly sceptical of things, but we also are susceptible spookily to kind of connections. So, so even the tiniest twinkle kind of might precipitate us into doing things we might not otherwise do. And so what really tilted me in my decision was to discover some kind of really mysterious connections, which I'd never known about, that I had with... Fleming and his background. So it turned out that my father, who is still alive and to whom I dedicated the biography, he was a journalist before he was a diplomat. And he had shared a desk in 1953 with John Pearson, the oh. first biographer of, of Fleming, the first authorized biographer. John had then, after sharing a desk with my father, he had joined Fleming on Atticus on the Sunday Times as his leg man. My father had then joined Frank Giles on the Times, who was going to become Fleming's successor as foreign manager 
on the Sunday Times. So uh, these two I brought back together 66 years later for lunch um, while I was making, you know, while I was making my decision. And it was a lovely meeting. And, and, and John Pearson kind of gave me his blessing to to enter his biographical domain. And not only that, he gave me this precious thing, his Fleming file, which had wow. all sorts of you know, information he'd picked up over the years since his biography, including a wonderful letter from Malcolm Muggeridge, kind of warning him that Bond was the devil and had destroyed Fleming's life, and he hoped it wouldn't destroy Pearson's life. The, and, and, and there was another essay that he, John Pearson had written called The Curse of Bond, which we can go into later about how Bond is quite a, a, a talismanic problem to many people who try and possess him or come into contact with him. And and he's quite a dangerous figure. You mustn't uh, try and outmatch him. So there was my father's link with, with John Pearson. Um, then um, I discovered that my grandfather, who was a medical doctor in the war, in the First World War, he had met Val Fleming in Ypres in 1915. Val Fleming had helped him take out 359 bodies from the hospital in Ypres, which my grandfather was in charge of, and takes them out to a field. And they both inherited the same cloud of chlorine gas. And these are these are tiny, you know, unimportant in themselves connections. But, you know, I thought, my God, my grandfather met Val Fleming. And then my great uncle, um, Geoffrey Shakespeare, was Churchill's right-hand man at the Admiralty for the first nine, eight months of the war. He was the parliamentary private secretary to Churchill. So literally upstairs, where Fleming is sitting at the desk in room 39, literally upstairs, and I, I went to 39, room 39 and I walked upstairs just to check this. He can hear Churchill's steps above the ceiling and he can hear my great uncle's steps, Geoffrey, above the ceiling too. So I thought that Fantastic. was a really kind of interesting connection. My uh, From a younger generation, my son, uh, my eldest son was in the same house then as Fleming at school. And like him had been Victor Ludorum, which was the proudest wow. thing Fleming ever had of his school days. So was that, that was Timbrels? a kind of, well, Slater's that's a house. Timbrel, uh, Timbrel, and, 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 and there was a Slater's Fleming house. room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no one's heard, the Fleming room at Timbrel's, um, you know, Peter Fleming was the most famous Etonian has ever been, and that was yeah. really put up for Peter Fleming, but no one's heard of Peter Fleming now, and now yeah. there are all these posters. But that was another kind of signal to me. Now, on my my mother's side, my, my grandfather, my mother's side, a man called S.P.B. Mace, was a very prolific um, author. He read about 350 books, and he had taught Alec War at Sherburne and had got published Alec War's book, The Loom of Youth, which was a great scandalous novel about homosexuality at, at Sherburne at British public schools. And Alec had become a very great admirer of my grandfather. And my grandfather had taught Alec the real principles of how to write. And above all, that you've got to have this rigid discipline every day to do 2,000 words without fail, from which nothing must deviate you. And Alec impressed this upon Ian, not only probably impressed upon him Jamaica, because Alec had visited Jamaica in the 1920s and written about it and about Montego Bay. So probably Alec had, had first planted the idea of Jamaica with Ian Fleming, but also this the idea of the essential ingredient if you're going to be a writer. And the other thing that, that is kind of, uh, uh, again, these are tangential spooky connections, but my grandfather also told Alec a, a, a story in our family of how we had some Jamaican relatives who were born um, from a, a kind of wicked, kind of great, great grandparent of mine who had a sugar plantation and obviously had children with some of his workers. And there was a, a family of Macy's out in Jamaica. And my grandfather told Alec this. Alec, when he was in the doldrums in in the 1950s, suddenly kind of meets my grandfather, who's just met one of these relatives, a, a black poet called Roger Mace. And Alec is sparked, cert certainly Alec War War's son, Peter, told me, to write this book, Islands in the, Island in the Sun, which becomes a Hollywood bestseller, uh, biggest advance ever paid for a, 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 a book for a movie, a famous musical which is listened to by a young man in Jamaica who that moment is a small uh, working for Fleming 
Um, his mother is Fleming's kind of girlfriend. And this is Chris Blackwell, who names his company Island Records after the book. And Chris Blackwell, as you know, now owns Goldener. So this, this, so these are these are kind of little connections that, as I say, are unimportant, but but kind of spookily. Uh, I use that word again, spookily affirmative that I should be doing this book. And then finally, this is the last connection. My wife, who's an Icelandic Canadian from Winnipeg, she told me, oh, William Stevenson, he, he's, he's linked with our family somehow. <laughs> well, how he's linked with her family is that William Stevenson, as you know, the quiet America, the quiet Canadian, the, the man called Intrepid, um, the man who, if anyone was a, a model for Bond, Ian Fleming said this would be the chief model, his boss, of, you know, in British intelligence in, in America during the war. Well, it turns out that William Stevenson, according to my uh, late father-in-law, who is the man who reveals this, in 1980, Dr. George Johnson, my, my, my father-in-law, reveals that William Stevenson is not a quiet Canadian. And he, 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 he's actually Icelandic. He's <laughs> the son of a, a, a woman, an Icelandic woman who abandoned him um, to my wife's relatives in Winnipeg, who, whose anglicized name he took, Stefansson. And that there was a reason that he was a quiet Canadian, because he'd left Winnipeg in 1922 in disgrace, having defrauded my father-in-law's patients because of a company fabricating can openers, which went bankrupt. And he'd never come back to Winnipeg until 1980, when um, he'd always been afraid of arrest. Anyway, I thought this was absolutely gripping. And so I decided I would indeed agree to write this biography. So that's a rather long answer. <laughs> that's a fantastic answer, uh, Nicholas. I mean, I think it also gives a sense of of actually the book that you've written because the, my my brain is now fizzing with all the things that you've just said and this is really the the kind of almost pointillistic effect of what you've done in this book which is you've thrown in not just personal experiences but all of these kind of little threads and all of these little angles um you mentioned um for example peter fleming and some of the research that you've done before uh, he was, a, I think, in his own right, a fascinating character and would, would probably warrant, actually, uh, at some point, the kind of treatment that you've done on Ian. But he sort of overshadowed him to some extent, um, probably, I think, contributed to some of the reputation of the, the sort of chocolate sailor because Peter was really a man of action. It occurred to me when you were talking about, you know, transplanting, Ian transplanting his experiences that it wasn't it was he transplanted the, the 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 wartime experiences to the cold war but also if he had been able to do some of the things that he wanted to do uh, in the field which of course he was forbidden precisely because he was so valuable but what, one thing we wanted to ask is from your side you've explained very well there what what kind of provoked you into taking the job but do you have any sense of why I mean, the, the two previous biographies, John Pearson's biography and, and Andrew Lysett's, are both excellent biographies. So on the surface of it, it seems like a strange idea. We, we now know that you, you've pulled this off and have done an extraordinary, what, what might have seemed an, an impossible thing to do. But do you know from their perspective why the, why the Fleming family, what prompted this decision, not just to ask you, but, but also just simply to, to, have a, to, to want to have a third biography written in this way? I I asked Kate and Lucy recently. They they they, they kind of came and took me out uh, to a pub lunch to thank me after the biography came out. You know why had they chosen me? And I I think it, it, the idea was that they had read Six Minutes in May uh, about mm. Churchill's coming to power, in which I had used Peter tangentially. They probably also read my biography of Bruce Chatwin. I think in which I'd spent seven years following somebody who's very similar to Fleming, somebody who has a kind of restlessness and is attractive to both sexes and is voraciously curious about the world. They had similarities. Um, I, I would, I, I think what I, my sense is, I can't speak for them, but I, I got a sense that they felt that a lot more material had come out since Andrew Lysett's book in nineteen. 65. So, you know, basically 30 years had passed between John Pearson and Andrew's book. And then another 30 years had come 
past and a lot more material they felt had come out since that um, probably needed to be uh, kind of incorporated in, in, in a fresher portrait for the 21st century. I, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. So I, 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 can't, I can't speak for them. But I, I think they felt there was still more to say. And I, I was rather pleased and relieved to discover there was. Yes, absolutely. Yes. It's a little bit like writing about the Beatles, Nicholas. Everyone says everything's been written and then someone yeah. comes up with what you've come up with. It's it's amazing. And it, as we said, every, on every new page. To talking about that... Um... Or, Churchill, or Churchill, actually. I mean, I think yeah, maybe, oh, yeah. going back to Churchill, just a second, I knew nothing about Churchill when I did the book on, on things. So maybe it's quite good not to know too much. And so you yes. would you might then look for and discover... Of course, uh, yeah. Traditional paths into, into what is... I mean, there are more books on Churchill than there are on Napoleon. And I, I yeah. there are lots of books on Ian, too. I mean, they come out the whole time. Yeah, that's true. But so I, I think just because a story has been told doesn't mean it can't be retold, and maybe it needs to be retold. Well, especially the way you've done it. Could you talk, Nicholas, about your methodology a little bit? You've got access to archives... There was, a, as you say, the 30-year-old, all of the material had been declassified. Tell us about how you begin the process. What, the, How do you shape this block of stone into this, you know, the statue you've crafted? What is your process as a, as a novelist slash biographer? And also specifically in this process of writing Ian Fleming, The Complete Man? Well, so there were, there were various things that I luckily, you know, could get access to. My son was, as I say, at Eton at the time in the same house. So I could go down and I could go into the room at Pop, which no one's allowed to get into. But my son was in Pop, so he was able to take me into this, this secret room. And so I would understand the background of where Ian had showers, where he cooked his, his toast. And, uh, you know, these are my son's, this is my son's quarters. Um, then I, um, so there were, there were, there were places that, that I felt comfortable with, you know, private school, public school, boarding school. I felt comfortable. I could tackle that. Also journalism. You know, I was on the times myself as a staffer. I, I've reported abroad. I understood Ian's Sunday times kind of, um, world and, it was, I suppose, the the wartime uh, episodes that became clearly where I was going to rise or fall with, with what I found. I had a very great help from Michael Smith, yes. um, the intelligence historian. He had he had uh, amassed various references he'd discovered in in the National Archives. I mean, what I came to realize about archives is that I could spend the next 20 years trying to find Ian Fleming material in the National Archives, because not only, uh, uh, I mean, on one level, many, much has been destroyed. I mean, we know masses was destroyed. I mean, Maud Russell at the end of the war was just burning everything in the Admiralty and, and SOE's files were destroyed and the Bletchley files were destroyed. But a lot has survived, but it hasn't necessarily survived in where you might look for it. So so much, I'm sure, will be discovered still by researchers finding something out of the corner of their eye in the National Archives, which will suddenly be a Fleming kind of manuscript that's gone there. But I could spend 20 years and I probably wouldn't find much more. So I made a conscious decision that I wouldn't waste too much time in the National Archives. I would rely on people who tilled in that vineyard, like Michael, to give me stuff and and I'm incredibly grateful to them for doing so. Um, the, probably the biggest stroke of luck I had, and, and also I want to sing the praise of Nicholas Rankin, who's a very old friend of mine, but he wrote, the, you know, by far the best book on 30 AU. And Nicholas, you know, endorsing my idea that, um, that the best writers are also the most generous. You know, he gave me all his archive and boxes of books and helped me enormously. Um, in, you know, and it was through him that I contacted the last surviving um, member of 30 AU, Bill Marshall, and he really was a stroke of luck. And this again, you need not only superstition but luck. So I ring Bill, who's ninety six, and I say, "Could I come and see him?" And he says, "Okay." And we fix 
to come and see him in uh, in Milton Keynes, I think he lived, uh, on the following Wednesday. And I'm so excited that I've taken it to be the Wednesday, so I think it's Monday when I ring in, and I'm taking it to be in two days' time. He had taken it to be kind of when, you know, 10 days' time. So I turn up in the afternoon and, you know, there's no lights on. I knock on the door and there's a gruff boy who says, who is it? And I tell him, he said, you're meant to come next week. So I apologize. Anyway, he opens the door and we have five hours, absolute gold dust. Um, this is a man who was one of the Marines in 30 AU, the, you know, the muscle that protected the brain, all the scientific boffins that are going out to try and find top secrets in, in, in occupied Germany. And he turned out to be linked to so many areas of Ian Fleming's field in Northern Europe. He'd not only met Fleming in you know, 1944 in Northern France when he came to visit Carteret, but he had driven one of the lorries that were trying to send stuff back to Bletchley. He had gone into Kiel um, with the first band, uh, T1, I think, uh, and with Dun Gunston Curtis. And he had seen um, the, the factory where they made all this top secret fuel. And he dug up, he showed me a photograph, he dug up some of the top secret, these aluminum boxes containing, you know, top secret designs for German torpedoes. And so, Bill, we sat talking for, for five hours, and it was just as well I turned up so early because Bill was taken off to hospital five days later and I would never have got all the stuff that I'd got, um, which really was, it really underlaid um, my ability to write about 30 AU, I have to say. And it was a great privilege to have met him and, and um, I'm really pleased I was able to include him in the book. And I really wanted to combine, you ask about my process of writing. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm a, a great admirer of Bruce Chapman who felt that, you know, you can use journalistic techniques. So in the book, I have myself interviewing Bill Marshall. I don't, I, I felt that was good to have somebody alive speaking like that. And so what, what other things did I learn? I mean, I, I had luck, I had um, very important was Fiona Morgan, um, yeah. Ian's stepdaughter. And again, a really weird coincidence. My father, her, her, she was married to a diplomat, John Morgan, and, and we took over from Fionn and John Morgan in Rio in 1966, um, mm -hmm. uh, their position. So I'd known Fionn a bit in my life and her daughter. And so Fionn, I was able to go, you know, and talk to, she was the one person who remembers Ian. In fact, I think she told me that age 14, she even stumbled into his room when he was naked. So she's the, the one person alive who does remember Ian Fleming naked. But <laughs> um, she was fabulous to, to be able to help me understand his very complex character and possibly the even more complex character of her mother, Anne Rothermere. Yes. And it was very important to have her on side. And I think it was very important to have the, I couldn't have done this without the Flemings, you know, they opened doors in terms of just allowing people to speak to me freely. Um, and I hope I've, I've rewarded their trust because um, uh, it was wonderful to have that. So, so Fionn couldn't have been more helpful in, in, in helping me build up this papier-mâché portrait of her stepfather. Um, you mentioned there the, the help that the Fleming family gave you, um, something AJ and I both discussed was um, that you've sort of laid out, you have a family tree of the Flemings. It's quite difficult sometimes to get a grip on exactly who is who. Uh, you know, there was another famous writer in the family and, you know, who as a, there are writers now in the family. Um, I was wondering if we could just sort of talk us through the kind of setup as it as it is now with the with the Fleming estate, like the key people who 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 open these doors for you and who they are and and what the Fleming family's involvement is in this you know ongoing you know iconic uh, figure of James Bond. Well, I mean, it's 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 fantastically complicated. Yes. The, the Flemings. I mean, there there are many of them. Uh, if I could reduce it in my head, I feel that. You have you have two lots of Flemings 
that descend from the grandfather, Robert Fleming. So one of the, the, the most um, useful journeys I did, I took James Fleming, who owns the book collector and who is a writer himself, and who is the nephew of Ian through his father, Richard. Um, Ian's younger brother, Richard, is James's father. And uh, he, James had never been to Dundee, where Robert, where the Flemings kind of come from. And so I said, well, would you, could you come with me and we could kind of see it through Fleming eyes. And so we had a marvelous 24 hours in Dundee where we went back to the slum where Robert Fleming was born. You know, this is a man who, whose father owns one pound a week as a jute merchant. And Robert Fleming is born in a two bedroom slum and he rises to become one of the richest men in Europe with a house in Grosvenor Square, which becomes the American embassy where Joseph Kennedy is ambassador and Robert Kennedy and, and, and Jack Kennedy is there. And so this man, uh, Robert Fleming, has this house outside Henley, a Joyce Grove where Churchill comes shooting. I mean, one of the things going up to Dundee with James Fleming was to discover, and this is why it's so important to, to go to places as a researcher. It's no good. You can't do everything just from books. You have to go there. And it was only by going to Dundee, we had a taxi driver who pointed out the Queen's Hotel. He said, oh, that's where Churchill used to stay when he was MP for Dundee. Now, neither James or I remembered that Churchill had been MP for Dundee. And it was always a mystery to me, why is Churchill such a great friend of the Fleming family? He would go shooting at Joyce Grove and he did the obituary for Val Fleming in whose right. regiment Churchill uh, Val had been. Um, why, were, why were the Flemings, the, you know, the son of, a, of, a, of an impoverished jute worker, how did they get to know Churchill? And it suddenly became apparent that Churchill becomes MP in Dundee in the same year, 1907 or eight, as Robert Fleming begins his bank in London, you know, his merchant bank, and he's becoming one of the richest men in England and moves down to, has moved down to London. So, of course, he'd be the richest Dundonian Churchill would know. And so, of course, Churchill would beat a path to his door and want to go shooting at Joyce Grove. But I, none of us had realised this, not even the Flemings had realised this importance until we went up to Dundee. And... So in Dundee, one saw the kind of extraordinary origins of this family. Um, uh, Robert Fleming started the first investment trust company, blah, blah, blah. And, but in Dundee, he's completely forgotten. I mean, the, the only person they think of in Dundee is Desperate Dan from Bina, who's <laughs> there's, a, there's a statue of him in the centre of Dundee. But I mean, the word Fleming, I, there's an estate that he paid for in the 1920s, the Fleming estate, but apart from that, there are a few traces uh, of um, he, he reminded me very much of Logan Roy and Succession, do you, who also comes from Dundee. And you remember, he yeah. goes back to Dundee and he goes back to the house where he's born. He doesn't dare get out of the car. Well, I felt yeah. that was a bit like Robert Fleming. From um, Duke to Luke. So, so what, 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 so going back to your, your, your question that, so Robert Fleming has these two sons, um, Val, his favorite, who will then be have four children including ian ian will be the second son peter ian richard and and michael and he will have another son philip and it's philip after val dies in 1917 it's philip who will then take over the bank the fleming bank now one of the kind of the kind of thorny the thorny problems that I found in trying to understand Fleming's wealth, because, you know, Fleming was the grandson of poverty, but the son of wealth. But he himself, Ian, though surrounded by lots of wealthy people, wasn't himself, although astonishingly wealthy by in comparison with other people of his generation, he wasn't wealthy compared with other Flemings. Now, it was very uh, difficult to try and find out what had happened. So this is what I think after five years, that Robert Fleming sets up his merchant bank in 1908 with his two sons, Philip and Val, as partners. So it's a three-type 
operation. When Philip, when Val dies in 1917 in France, it seems that the share, his share of the bank, reverts to the other two partners, his father and his brother, and it doesn't go to his widow or the children. Now, what happens in the next 10 years or 20 years, the bank becomes astronomically successful. I mean, apparently, Robert Fleming's in charge of kind of three trillion pounds worth of business. You know, that by this time, they've got Anglo-Persian oil, you know, BP. Uh, it becomes fantastically successful. So I think there's some expectation from Val's widow, Eve, that there's some adjustment will be made when Robert dies. And Robert dies in 1933, but he just passes it all on to his wife. So they're then waiting another four years, five years until Granny Katie dies, hoping that the Val side of the family will inherit some of this massive wealth. Well, either, either they have to act under Laura's instructions or whatever, but the point is, Granny Cahey doesn't change the will either. So she dies in test state. So the entire estate goes to the surviving two daughters and son of Robert and Kate. And nothing goes to um, Val's side of the family, his four sons. And I think Eve, Val's widow, is furious. And there's great spats. And not that Eve has dressed herself in glory because she's had yes. a legitimate child with Augustus John Amaryllis. Um, and so the, the long and short of it is that Ian's three brothers all strangely kind of benefit from, from, from the Robert Fleming millions because what happens? Well, his younger brother, Michael and um, Richard both go and work for Fleming's bank. And Peter works, is going to work for, it, for a bank, but can't stand it. So he becomes a, 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 a travel writer, etc. But Peter is given Merrimoles, the 2,000-acre birch, Beechwood estate outside Henley, I think by Philip, as kind of compensation. And um, Richard marries a cousin who is going to inherit a lot from from Robert Fleming's estate anyway. He marries the uh, Robert's um, granddaughter through, through um, a wife hole. So the one person who doesn't win out is Ian. He gets nothing from the, the, the benefits of his grandfather. Everyone thinks he's wealthy. He's perfectly wealthy compared with your eye, but he has to earn a living. And I think this, this is a very important kind of prod in his life and without the necessity to earn a living he probably wouldn't have written James Bond because I think James Bond also was probably he hoping going to make his fortune and kind of right ironic at the end it, it did but it was almost too late for him so in answer to your question how do I understand the uh, the Flemings uh, I go back I think there were the banking Flemings and there are the literary Flemings, and sometimes the literary Flemings join the banking Flemings. I mean, Richard's children, Adam, and, uh, you know, Adam became chairman, I think, of Flemings at one point. Richard became chairman of Flemings. So, so some of the literary Flemings, Val's children, also worked for the banking Flemings. So it's quite a confusing tangle to, and so they're all slightly involved with the estate, and very keen to preserve the, you know, the legacy of Ian. That's incredibly useful. And that family tree in the beginning of the book was a, such a simple but groundbreaking thing. I, I believe there's a family tree in the Fleming's office because they need to know who everyone is sometimes. I, I just noticed that once. Nicholas, could you just talk, paint it on that line, continue, could you just paint a, paint a picture of Kate and Lucy and Fergus and James as they are now, what their roles are now in preserving the Fleming legacy and the James Bond literary legacy. How do you sort of give us a thumbnail sketch of those characters, those people? Well, I think, so Kate and Lucy are the sisters of Peter. Sorry, the sisters of... Um, Daughters. 
daughters of Peter. And they, I think, take a very strong interest. They knew their uncle Ian. I think they are very keen to preserve his legacy. I know that um, they take an interest in, we have to kind of not cloud the issue with the, the films are very different from, yes. the, from the literary estate. Yes. And there is a, in Fleming Publications, I think that has been taken over or been given largely to the next generation, the, the children of Lucy. Rob, um, Robert and Diggory. Diggory and Robert. And then I think and Jesse and uh, the two other uh, sisters, yeah. the, the children of, of, of Kate, they're all on the board, I think, of the of the Fleming publications and make decisions about, I imagine, you know, retrieving the copyright from yeah. Random House to, now to their own imprint. Mm -hmm. And I imagine there's a lot of kind of merchandise or, or licensing that they talk about. So I, I think the next generation is now being, you know, guided into taking control of the next phase. And Fergus. So you go. So Fergus. So Fergus is a writer, a very good writer, and I think Fergus is now sitting also on that. Um, Fergus is fantastic. He runs the Queen Anne Press, which Ian had bought off Lord Kemsley. Um, I can't remember if he bought it for a pound or not, but anyway, it, 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 it's the Queen Anne Press and it's been publishing fantastic stuff. I mean, it's published, I know, John Pearson's um, nice. notes, which are were gold dust um, to me. I mean, all the, the, the yeah. notes that he'd written when he was interviewing the people for his biography, which are now in the Lilly Library. And so Fergus does this very bespoke, um, highly beautiful published books. Um, he, he did a very good edition of Ian's journalism, Talk of the Devil, yep. which included one or two short stories, yep. very useful collection of journalism. And then, he, as I say, these notes. And now I can't remember if it's him or, or I don't think it's the Queen Anne Press who are doing John Pearson's biography of James Bond. But um, so, so Fergus in, involves himself with the Queen Anne Press and James, the other strand of Ian, his book collecting side, the book collector, James has been editing and owning the book collector, which is a marvelous. Um, I don't even get a chance to read it, but it's so it's got so many interesting articles. Um, it's a quarterly, but it, my goodness, it's fantastic. Uh, I've become really uh, addicted to it. And so and they're deliciously James, presented as well, aren't they? No, they're really I'm, I'm, I'm not really a bibliophile, but I've become one. Um, <laughs> and I've got to know James, probably the best of them all. I've got to know James. And I really, uh, we've got a. I really like him. I really admire him. We've had great fun together, and he's been very helpful. Both Fergus and James, I have to say, were incredibly helpful in the first text that I, when I gave them, uh, you know, I, I made sure that the Fleming family had no control over what I was going to write. I agreed to do this biography, so I should have said this earlier. When I said yes, it was on condition that I had complete editorial independence because I didn't think it would help anybody, me, the Fleming estate, Fleming's reputation, to have a sense that they had in any way controlled me. I mean, clearly they had to read it and they had to comment and, you know, correct me if I got any mistakes, but they had no control over the editorial content. And I had, in fact, I had to find my own publisher. They paid no money to me. Um, it was all, um, it was all independent of them, but with their, under their auspices, so to speak. But um, so when I get, I finished the manuscript, I get, I Kate and Lucy read it and gave connect, correct corrections and uh, suggestions, and James and Fergus also, and we were very helpful. And James and Fergus are Richard's sons, just for the record. They are Richard's sons, yeah. yes, and the wonderful daughters Mary, um, who helped me very much, um, and Adam helped me, his his other son, yeah, and um, I also saw Sandra. Who, the other sister, and they all had wonderful memories up at Black Mountain. Yes. So bit by bit, and each one had a different story, and so I was able to get new new material. Uh, and did you visit Black Mount? Did you say you'd visited? That's the one Black thing I haven't I haven't visited Black Mount. <laughs> there were a couple of places I hadn't visited. Um, Black Mount was one of them. Um, but I tell you, you know, spooky coincidence number kind of eighteen 
is that my cousin, I have a cousin Daisy McNally, who said to me, oh gosh, uh, do you want to come and see Sevenhampton? Because my father-in-law owns Sevenhampton. And it turned oh, out wow. that Paddy, Paddy McNally now lives at Sevenhampton, you know, Fleming's last house where he's buried. And yeah. I was able to get access, which not many people are, through yeah. my, my distant cousin Daisy to go and see the house and see the be Fleming's bedroom and everything. So that, that again, was was another kind of indication I was possibly the right person to do the book. No, I, no, yeah. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> no, I think you should say that. I think I think your answers are giving some kind of a sense of the uh, extraordinary um, amount of research uh, that, that you've gone into. Um, I mean, uh, something that I wanted to very quickly touch on that you mentioned earlier was that there's so much in this book uh, that, that, we, that we could talk about. But you've sort of brought out a few things that perhaps weren't uh, as obvious as they were before. Um, you've got access to unprecedented archives. You've you've interviewed almost everybody who you could possibly interview. Um, even more astonishingly, you did all of this uh, during a global pandemic. Um, and I'm just wondering, because I remember we'd had a conversation at some point about archives being closed, you know, to the public. Was that also something that, you know, that you had to get around? Did that hamper you in any way? Or, or was it fine because, you know, you could talk to people, you, you, you could go places, you could go to Dundee. But, but were there things that you sort of had to wait out for or things that, that sources yes, like that? I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the, I waited and I'm glad I did wait. I mean, the, the pandemic was awful in one respect because I couldn't go to places and see people. But another thing, what happened, I don't know if you experienced this, people suddenly became much more prepared to talk on the telephone. Right, yes. And suddenly... Um, because I couldn't go and see an 80 year old person, which might have, you know, spent a whole day going to see them and coming back. Yeah. Actually, we could have an amazing conversation for an hour on the phone. Yeah. And uh, it was probably much better than if I'd gone to see them. Yeah. Uh, so, so I was able to do interviews like, you know, I interviewed Fleming's lawyer, um, Michael, and I interviewed, yeah, I, I interviewed some elderly people who probably I wouldn't have been able to see uh, in the flesh because of COVID. Um, the one thing I had, I didn't go to the National Archives, as I said, and I, I, I never went to the National Archives. I, I, um, it was the one archive I never went to. I, I kind of began to make a decision that if I go there, I will never come out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I had to realize, I said, on people like Michael Smith and others who had, who had found some troves. But I, the big archive for me was always going to be Fleming's own archive in the Lilly Library in Indiana. And I couldn't go there during COVID. But in a way, I'm really pleased I didn't go there until right at the end. Because if I'd gone at the be beginning, I think I would have spent my entire time writing out everything I found. Yeah. Whereas when I went at the end, I knew what was now going to be new. And so I only needed to spend about five days there. And everything that I that I hadn't discovered, you know, I discovered an amazing interview with Claire Blanchard that Fergus had somehow overlooked. It, it was dynamite, you know, the, 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 and that was just there lying there and it hadn't been seen. Now, if I'd gone early on without realising, uh, I would have just tried to do too much, I think. Yeah. So that was very helpful to go to the, the last stage. Um, as I say, I caught one or two people before they died. I, I slightly became a kind of grim reaper because they, they, seemed, they seemed to die shortly after I'd seen yes. them. But um, there was no one really that I missed out who uh, who kind of still I felt had amazing material to give me. I mean, people were very generous, people like Raymond Benson um, and Mike Van Black and, and above all, John Cork. Yes. I'd met him before COVID in London. And, you know, I felt a trespasser slightly. You know, I, I'm not, any, I don't know much about Fleming. I've been asked to do this. I, I think I'm going to do this. I can see what they must have seen me with slight goggle eyes as a, as a bit of a chump who was a bit presumptuous, but they became incredibly cut. I mean, John was again, very, very helpful in reading the manuscript and correcting me and adding more stuff It's sparking off in his idea. Um, he, he was very, very good. I, I'd say John was almost the most important kind of close reader because he knows everything yes. um, about Fleming. 
and he was not at all competitive or jealous. Well, he, I didn't. He didn't seem to be, yeah. uh, and I'm incredibly grateful to him for. For I mean, the book wouldn't be what it is without him and people like uh, like my, my Mike Van Blaricum and, and and those other helpers and Raymond Benson too. I mean, Raymond gave me all his archives uh, from Claire Blanchard letters, and and Jonathan Cuneo. I, I got hold of Ernie Cuneo's son, um, and. Right at the last moment, I mean, it's so odd. Uh, I was in touch with Ivor Bryce's nephew, um, uh, Mount Batten. Um, and he suddenly said, I, I've just been looking at this file. I think you ought to come down. And I delivered, I was about to deliver the manuscript on that Friday. It, it had to be in on that Friday. And he said, I think you ought to come down because the, I found some really interesting letters from um, Ernie to Ivor. And I found the manuscript that Ivor wrote of his memoir, You Only Live Once, which had to be withdrawn because Kevin McClory kind of issued an injunction. And you ought to see it. I think there's new stuff in it. So I, I ran my publisher. I said, can I deliver on Monday? I'm just going down to, to see this, this possible piece of um, a new material. And it was wonderful. There was Janet Milford Haven, um, I was um, the, the 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 mother lying there, telling me all about how she had decided it should be Sean Connery, who should play Bond. Ian had taken her out to lunch with Sean Connery at the Savoy when they were, uh, and she said, "You've got to get that's him. That's the man you want for Bond." Anyway, she was there able to tell me these stories, and then I looked at the material in this file, and it was wonderful. You not only was. Ivor's manuscript, uh, You Only Live Once, had terrific new stuff about the McClory trial, which had never been printed before. But there are also these four or five letters between Ernie and Ivor, you know, all about Ian. And so th th this was incredibly helpful. Well, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely diamonds to read. And I just want to go a little bit more about the manuscript, the undiscovered stuff. Um, little known things that our audience here would appreciate. Could you talk a little bit about what your knowledge of or, or uh, is of the state of excitement, the Ian Fleming sort of non-fiction book about Kuwait? Could you sort of tell us what you know of that and what happened to that? So I think it was in 1960, he's commissioned by the Kuwaiti Oil Company to do a non-fiction book on Kuwait. And he goes out for three weeks. I think he's going via Beirut, where he's probably going to do some stuff for British intelligence, for for Norman Denning. Um, Philby's in Beirut at the time, significantly. And, and Ian had known Philby in the 30s, when, who was a friend of um, Alaric Jacob, who was at Reuters with Ian and I managed to get Alaric's son to show me the diary entries where Alaric's having lunch with Ian and, Phil and, and Philby in the 30s. So Ian had known Philby and Ian on his way to Kuwait stops in at Beirut to do something to do with Philby, we don't quite know what, and then continues to Kuwait and spends I don't think he spends very long there mm. and writes this book very quickly. I mean, he's amazingly quick at writing. Uh, that's what I'm so full of. I'm so impressed by the speed with which he... Um, Peter had this too. I mean, if you read Brazilian Adventure or News and Tartary, I mean, the amount of information that he manages to gather and then condense and then write effortlessly in this seamless book. Well, Ian had that same, that same facility. And so, you know, he goes to Kuwait for this short time, writes this book, which is full of good stuff. I mean, it, but I think the Kuwaitis felt it was a bit... Um, critical of the of the royal family then and so it's never been published and it lies in a manuscript form there's one copy I've read in, in the Fleming archives in Nettlebed and I think there's one copy in the Lilly library I mean it's it's, it's got in I mean it's completely dated but it's got some very good shafts and, and passages and but it's never been published so the only other the, the, the holy grail for Fleming collectors, of course, is the Black Daffodil. Oh, the wow. Vol yeah. The volume of poetry he apparently privately printed in 1928 and then burnt every single copy, as he told Ivor Bryce. 
Now, whether he did burn every single copy, I have no idea. But if, if ever a, a copy, it's, it strikes me as very odd. I don't think a writer publishes a book and burns every single copy. I, I, I'm right. sure that the copy must exist somewhere, and that will be worth a lot of money. Whether that whether it'll be worth the money for the poetry, I have not idea because <laughs> some of the, the, the poems exist in uh, possibly in his notebooks, and they're not kind of brilliant. They're they're kind of pale imitations of Rupert Brooke. Uh, yeah. Perfectly okay, but a young man's kind of forlorn wanderings um, that, that, you know, some woman's left him or he's left some woman. Um, if, if the wages of the sin of death count me out, I think, or something is one of them. I can't remember what um, you've whetted our appetite. You mentioned the Fleming archive in Nettlebed. Can you talk to us about that? Uh, what's there and what you know of it? Well, so the family have this archive, which I'm sure um, people can apply to go and look at it. And it's got a lot of the scrapbooks of all the kind of the books, the kind of reviews in them. And then it's got all the correspondence that I think Andrew Lysett probably used for his biography um, when I think Nicole Fleming, Kate and Lucy's brother, yeah. was had, had in charge. And I think it's got a lot of the kind of, the, it's got the McClory trial um, papers. It's got the Eve riveting the Eve um, Fleming um, case in the High Court against the Marchioness of of Winchester, and it had. But otherwise, it's correspondence business. Probably the correspondence from the Sunday Times and and from uh, from after he left the Sunday Times in, with Cape a lot of Cape correspondence, and it's fairly well kind of organized. Um, Fergus went through it when he did his book, The Man with the Golden Typewriter. Um, and there's, there's, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, to be honest, there wasn't, it, it didn't reveal. No, no. So no kind of gold dust, but there were one or two reader's letters, for instance, which were quite good. And um, one or two photographs that were surprising. But the, 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 the and it oh it had that the, that thing I mentioned at the end of the book the, the kind of proposal for a new film based on a plot that he'd always wanted to write about big business and it was you know it was just a two page proposal but in his description of what this novel would be was quite interesting and that hadn't been I did I felt that had been overlooked before well uh, talking of gold dust Nicholas as a tangential point. Um, you mention in the book uh, Jeffrey Jenkins, the South African author, who later on, under sort of encouragement of Fleming, wrote his own sort of Bond book. Do you know anything about that book? Is there any mention of it in the, in the archives? Have you, do, are you May, aware of that? It, it, just because I don't know doesn't mean there isn't stuff in the archives. Okay. I feel I got so blinded with a blizzard of names that I decided... I had to kind of be quite ruthless in who I didn't write about. But it struck me, as I, I'm sure both of you realise this, it soon became apparent that Fleming is such a kind of charismatic person to many people that you could write a book about so many facets of his life. You could write about That's Fleming true. and golf, Fleming and Eton, Fleming and women, Fleming and travel, Fleming and Jamaica. You could, you know, there's no end Fleming and Cars, Fleming and Wine. You could do no end of books. And so to, to keep my sanity, I felt I've really got to strictly keep myself to what I'm interested in, yeah. which, which isn't golf or and it isn't kind of cars. So I, you know, and I'm sorry about guns. I, I interviewed a man who, who Jeffrey Boothroyd, who'd been a lodger with Jeffrey Boothroyd, and I got a whole interview with him, but I never mentioned a word of it in the book because I thought, no, I, I can't do guns too. Um, and it struck me also, John Pearson said that, you know, Fleming didn't know much about anything like like Bruce Chapman didn't. But when he when he wanted to write about something, he went to the absolute mountainhead of the person who did know about it. And then he was able to get, mm. you know, from the expert what he needed. And I felt that's what most journalists do. So I didn't feel it made him an expert on anything. I mean, uh, so it's probable this manuscript, I think it's called Per Fine Outs, could exist. But like the Ark of the Covenant could be buried amongst all sorts of things. Well, like the Black Daffodil, but also, yes. there's a, there's, you know, there's a Fleming short story, the, the true tale of Captain Morgan or something. That was a short story he wrote, but it's never been found. I mean, I don't think there's too much to find because mm. 
what what does survive is extraordinary. I mean, the amount of correspondence that survives, the, the manuscripts that survive. I mean, I'm not sure what other hours in the day he had to write too much more. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, the few love letters have survived, as you know, to Edith Morpurgo. That's very interesting. Um, but I, I don't think, and you know, all the, you know, the love letters to Anne, uh, Fiona has, they, they've gone to the British Library. They're all in the public domain. So I would be surprised if much more is to be discovered. I mean, I do end the book with yes. the most amazing story, which was told to me by Thomas Hennage. And I I thought it was dynamite story, which is that Thomas Hennage, who was a friend of Casper's, is asked by Anne to just go through Casper's stuff uh, up in the room at Sevenhampton. So he goes up to the room and he sees an Ottoman trunk like they both had at Eton, and he opens it up and there's the manuscript for Titi Titi Bang Bang, which Ian had left to Casper, and then he picks that up and then suddenly there is, he describes it as a thick wadge, you know, very thick of typescript, and he starts reading it and he realizes it's a new Fleming novel that he's never read before. And he begins to see, you know, the film take shape in front of him. And in a great state of excitement, he comes down with this manuscript to Anne Fleming in the drawing room at Sevenhampton. And she's sitting on this chintz sofa by the fire. And he says, look what I found. And she looks at it and she says, oh, one of Ian's little boobies. And she just tosses it into the fire. And so Thomas Hennig is said he just looks at it flabbergasted as, as this thing going up in flames. And I don't know, I, I, I was loyal to keeping that as the final image of the book. I, th I think Kate had found it a bit negative, but I think, I felt it was actually an a, 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 a riddle and a fantastic mystery. And in this smoke, we have the whole secret of James Bond and the secret of how kind of Fleming created him. I mean, it's an astonishing uh, way to end the book. It's an absolute uh, bombshell moment because, of course, as a Fleming uh, fan and, and lover and Bond lover, uh, the idea that they're, that a we've we've lost you know a Fleming story, a Fleming novel, um, but also I mean for Anne to do that, um, obviously you, you've alluded she was an extremely complicated character and had a sort of uh, love-hate relationship with Ian and a hate-hate relationship with Bond but nevertheless uh, for her to throw that manuscript on the fire it would have uh, it, it would have made her a lot of money I mean quite quite cynically speaking it would have probably been made into a film you know it certainly would have sold sold lots and lots of copies all yeah. around the world do we know yeah. anything about what was in it or what it was about or anything like that no no, <laughs> no. we'll have to ask Thomas Hennig if he remembers anything but he should do, because I mean, he's one of the great, um, he's got one of the great bookshops, art bookshops in the world. Um, I think you'll have to interview him. We we have already set up an interview with him because we were absolutely blown away by this. Uh, I've been in contact with him and we, we will we will talk to him about it because it's a it's a fascinating uh, thing. I think what, some of, one, one thing I really love about this book is you've alluded to just how much material that you had to sort of cope with. And, and, you know, as a writer with this kind of material, you, you can end up feeling that you're going to go insane because there's so many avenues to go down, but the way that you presented it is a, it's a long book, but it's an extremely elegantly written book. It doesn't show uh, all of the uh, sort of effort that, but, you know, it seems rather effortlessly put together, even though it clearly yeah. is an enormous yeah. amount, an enormous <laughs> amount of work and research has gone into well, it. I I'm sitting to you here, you know, in Tasmania, where I've, I've come two or three times since COVID. And I remember sitting here last year, um, having to cut. So when I deliver the book, and I hadn't, I hadn't kind of calculated how long it was, I was meant to deliver 120,000. So right at the last moment, I put all the chapters together. And it's horrific. It's like, 250,000 words. And I remember seeing Mark <laughs> Amy saying, I hope it's going to be a short book. And I, and that, <laughs> And, and, and I saw Andrew Lysett, uh, you know, and I asked how long his book was, and mine was going to be even longer. And so I made a plea to my publisher. I said, look, is there any way, it seemed to naturally fall into two parts. Is there any way you'd consider a two-volume biography? Um, because, you know, we could have all the stuff that's building up to Fleming, and we could keep Bond until the second which I thought still could work, but the publisher said, no, I don't think two biographies work these days. So, but if you could cut it by 50,000 words, we could no, we could sure. probably then, then wow. do it on volume. So I came to Tasmania. At the desk I'm sitting at you now, 
for 10 hours a day for six weeks, I cut 50,000 words. And I think it's better. I think the book is better for it. I mean, I can't really remember what I cut, but I, I, the, 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 I don't think I, I any more. And I think I'd have severed an artery. But I, I think I, <laughs> there's all, there's all the. I think the book has got most of what I would like to have in it, and uh, and I'm sure it could still be cut further. And I thought the BBC. I don't know if you heard the BBC. Yeah. Um, yes. I thought it was fantastically cut and and done, wasn't it? Yes, uh, very, very nice. Yeah, very nicely done. Um, I mean, we won't we won't take up a huge amount more of your time, Nicholas. You've been very generous so far. Something I just wanted to touch on very quickly because um, I, I was rather pleased that uh, you had put this in the book, which is that you alluded to it earlier. I mean, his work at the Sunday Times with with the Mercury Network, uh, you've really um, kind of brought that a lot more into the light, as well as just his war his wartime intelligence role and how significant that was. Um, this network of correspondents that were quite famous correspondents, Henry Brandon, Anthony Terry, uh, many uh, uh, famous uh, names at the time were, were working directly under Fleming and that he was this sort of almost M-like figure at the centre of this network. And whether or not he was sort of overplaying or enjoying the fact that he might be sort of uh, controlling these spies or whether or not this was... Um, actually seems to have had a, a, a kind of informal intelligence gathering role. Uh, I think it's a fascinating uh, question. You interview the intelligence historian Christopher Moran, who says basically it looks like a spy agency. Uh, so I think it probably was a spy agency. I just wanted it about that and also this sort of world, this kind of Cold War world that Fleming was in, where, where journalism and kind of connections with MI6, dinners with MI6, if you could just... Talk a little bit about what, what, what you found out there. OK, well, I probably ought to introduce John Le Carre at, at this moment, who was a great friend of my father's at Oxford. And my father was going to take over from him at Eton as a teacher. And then they both joined the Foreign Office. And it was John Le Carre, a.k.a. David Cornwall, who, who really, when I was about 30, he'd read my first novel and I was you know, in this agony about whether uh, wanting to write full time and whether I had the talent or uh, to do it. And he said, look, I think you can do it. And why don't I offer you my house in Cornwall? Whenever you want to write, you can use it. And he had this wonderful writer's cottage nearby, uh, Tregiffian. So for 35 years, I uh, used that house uh, and wrote part of five books there. And got to know Le Carre, you know, in as much as anyone can get to know Le Carre, I got to know him. And I was asked by him, actually, his last public appearance at the German embassy, he asked me to present him there. And it was an amazing, it was two days before COVID. And it was an amazing event, you know, 300 people packed in this room listening to this, you know, this, this great writer of the post Second World War period. And one of the things I tested him on was his relationship with Fleming and with Stevenson. He'd known he'd come into touch with William Stevenson, who thought he was uh, he'd gone to uh, Bermuda. And he said, Dick White asked me if I saw him in Bermuda to ask him to return all his his Secret Service files. Yes. Uh, but I, it struck me that David Cornwall had constructed George Smiley in direct opposition to James Bond, consciously, so that he's everything Bond isn't. He's a kind of cuckolded, unattractive, middle-aged academic um, uh, that, that is, is with a, and morally torn. So everything Bond isn't. And it was almost as if he was consciously creating something in opposition to Fleming. And he was very kind of odd with me about Fleming. He said, oh, you don't want to write about that. I said, well, why not? He said, well, he's not very interesting. And I, I kind of prodded him. I said, well, look, David, can we just have a look at this? You uh, both leave your private schools early. You go to Switzerland and Middle Europe. You become skiers. You join the intelligence services. You both write your breakthrough novel in six or seven weeks. You both marry as your first wife, a woman called Anne, and then you start to take Paul Dane, who wrote um, Goldfinger. You make him for the spy who came in from the cold. You use 
Piers Brosnan and Sean Connery in your films. And you've just told me that you've done a six part adaptation of The Spy Coming from the Cold. And who do you want to play the part of Alec Lemus but Daniel Craig? <laughs> and you're telling me that you're not influenced by, you know, by Fleming. He said, well, oh, no, I haven't really read any of them. And then um, I, I talk about this with him on stage and he gets a bit, he gets a bit testy. Anyway, uh, we're meant to go, go down and stay with him that, that summer, but then, then, as you know, COVID happens and I'm continuing my research and suddenly I get this kind of, I get some tingling kind of ideas. I'm reading um, you know, Le Carre. Where does Le Carre get his pseudonym from? I mean, every... Uh, to every journey, he tells a different story. So to me, he said he was on a double-decker bus in the Tottenham Court Road and he, and he saw a shop, you know, shop front, Le Carré. Well, uh, that summer I read how Ian Fleming interviews Georges Simenon in Switzerland. And I go actually to the house where it took place, this interview. And uh, Fleming's discussing with Simenon how they get their ideas for characters. And Fleming tells Simonor he gets his ideas from shop fronts in France. He drives through villages and he sees the names of the shops. He gets his name of characters. And this kind of rings a bell with me. Isn't that what David said about the carry? And then I read how in, you remember in Thrilling Cities, Fleming goes to Monte Carlo, to the casino. Yes. I mean, I know he at one point he was going to do a documentary with Aristotle Onassis on the casino. Yes. Um, anyway, and this is where David... Cornwall goes with Ronnie, his father, his terrible father, and Ronnie gambles away at the, the gambling table all the kind of non-existent Cornwall fortunes. And the, the young David has to watch in terror while this is happening. Anyway, there is Fleming in the same kind of casino, and he talks about the gambling call uh, at the back of our table, and it is Le Carré. It's a gambling call. And I'm thinking, is it? And then I'm, I'm thinking, Le Chief. You remember in Casino Royale, the first villain is yeah. Le Chief, yes. which means a cipher. And then you've got with Fleming Le Cercle, you know, yeah. the, the, the gastronomic society he had in the 30s, which would go off to Deauville and Le, Le Touquet yes. to gamble. And suddenly this is kind of teeming in my head. And I, I, I write to David. I say, David, I know, you know, can I just go back to your pseudonym Le Carré? Is it possible that it is a response to all these things, that the gamblers call Le, Le Chief? The set, and I get no answer because he's just died. So I, I'll never know um, if Le Carré comes in response to Fleming. You're your final victim, Nicholas. <laughs> Nicholas, can I just, one of the things the book excels at is Fleming's legacy, in particular, maybe the second victim of the success of Bond, Casper. And I find it very moving and very beautiful how you sort of end that story. I know it's been written about in the letters of Anne Fleming and at your book launch, I met uh, Casper's first girlfriend. It was such a fascinating... Louise, uh, mm. ca can you talk to us about your feelings about Casper and his life and just explain to people, Fleming's only son, um, the connection with Ben Bond and Casper and, you know, the Casper legacy, so to speak, which your book does beautifully. But I'm glad... I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased you say that because one of the things when I was trying to cut 50,000 words, I thought, should I cut the Casper thing at the end, which would have saved a few thousand words. But I'd spent a lot of time, again, following an instinct, feeling that Casper, in a curious way, was an explanation for Ian in a way I couldn't put my finger on. And it was when Fionn said that he was bipolar that struck me that bipolar is what's called her an hereditable an heritable disorder, you, you, you inherit it. And it struck me that so many of the things we don't manage to understand about Ian, his contradictions, the fact he can be so many people, a kind of scrum of different people, seem to me to point to the fact that Ian had a bipolar aspect in his own personality. I mean, I didn't want to go into this in the book. I'm not competent to say this. Sure, but sure. I felt Casper, if I concentrate on Casper, it would reflect back at possibly Ian's um, character. And it also seemed to me that, you know, Casper was a little boy lost like Ian had been. He loses his father early. 
you know, Ian's about to tell him the facts of life on that 12th birthday when Ian dies. And Casper also represents the parents, you know, how they had not really been brilliant parents. And, 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 and he reflects back the characters of his parents, I suppose. And so I got to meet lots of his friends I, and girlfriends, and I bit by bit put together a kind of papier-mâché portrait. I mean, I'd never met him. It's a tragic yeah. life. And I was very helped, you know, by, by his friends like Mark Blackett Ord and by uh, Alison, who you met, uh, the, the former girlfriend, and by Rachel Fletcher, uh, Rachel That's Toynbee, right. who'd, who'd been his girlfriend. And Fionn was incredibly helpful. I mean, she had discovered him uh, after he'd killed himself and with the note in his pocket. Mm. Um, and I was very careful. I mean, I, I hope it is a moving and, and, and sensitive portrait, but I was very keen to have it in because I felt it kind of, it it, it was, you know, you, you, you stop at Ian's death. So why am I writing about something that took place in 1970, 75? But I felt it was important in some way. I have, I can't kind of I I can't describe all the importance but I'm glad you you felt it worked no it did. and as you say it sort of does tell you a bit about Ian himself I mean I think that's what I felt is. it did yes absolutely. It, I felt it told you about his his congested complications and his contract I mean you know uh, almost anything you say of Ian you can say the opposite so you know yes. it, People say, oh, he was born, oh, he wasn't born, he knew about art, he didn't know about it, he cared about money, he didn't care about money. I mean, everything. He's, he's In that respect, he's very much, again, like Bruce Chatwin, who possibly also had, had a bipolar aspect or a, whatever we call it these days. Uh, Nicholas, can I just ask, you mentioned that um, when you were approached to write this, you had been writing a novel for several years. Um, which I presume was the sand pit. Well, was... no, 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 the sand pit. I'd finished. I, okay. I, I was. Writing, I'd begun a novel, which I'm now about ah. to finish this week. A first draft of which I'm okay. Thrilled. Fantastic. Well, I'm very much looking forward to that because for I, I think the sand pit is a fantastic novel, and I think anyone who's listening to this uh, interview would, if they haven't read it already, should rush out and buy that as well as Ian Fleming, The Complete Man, of course, as well as your other books. But I think they'd be particularly interested because it's a spy novel. It's very much in the John le Carré tradition. It reminded me of the Russia House, uh, a little bit our game as well at points. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, uh, portrait of um, a journalist, a, kind of an Ambler-esque uh, feeling to it, who gets caught up in this uh, intrigue with a with an uh, Iranian chap who's uh, um, a, a fellow father at uh, his son's school. It's wonderfully done, uh, wonderfully paced, brilliant twists and turns, uh, beautifully written. I, I really, really recommend this novel. I think it's an absolutely classic uh, spy novel, uh, which I, I hope many, many more people will come to. Um, but I wanted to, it made me wonder, it made me think, um, if you were ever to be, you've written spy fiction, if you were to be approached by the Fleming estate, to write a Bond novel, would you be uh, interested in that? And if you were, what kind of direction do you think you could take that in? Well, funny you should say that because I was approached by, well, not by the Fleming State so much as the agent for the Fleming State, who was my agent, Gillen Aitken. Um, I can't remember when it was, but you'll be able to tell me exactly, because I'll tell you who was then chosen. So I, I said, okay, let me read all the books first. So I read them and I made notes and I came up with a plot and then the Fleming estate wanted to read a novel of mine just to see what I was like. So I, I suggested The Dancer Upstairs, which yeah. um, was made into a film by John Malkovich with Javier Bardem, which, you know, is a thriller. I, I felt I could, you know, anyway, I think they decided to, to pass on me. And the person they chose was much more suited for the project. And I think it did very well. And that was Sebastian Fawkes, an old friend of mine and wonderful novelist. So I, I, I was once approached and, 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 and offered to, to, to my services, but they would decline. OK, but this is tantalising. Uh, what do you remember? <laughs> do you remember anything about what you came up with? Was it was it modern plot or was it was it uh, set in the Cold War? Was it contemporary? Do you remember? I have a feeling he was a chicken farmer. Do you remember he was going to retire yeah. as a chicken farmer? Yes. I, I have a feeling it began in 68 or something like that. <laughs> um, 
I, I'll have a look. I'll have okay. a look because I make notes and uh, and um, did a lot of notes. And I, oh, um, don't do this, I, I used, Nicholas. I used some of the notes. I think when I when I had to kind of look back at, at you know all all his novels, I kind of tried to remember what I'd thought of them a few years before. <laughs> Amazing. That would have been two thousand eight. That was the centenary of Fleming's birth. Two thousand eight. Right. So that, that's, that's, that's that would yeah. have been okay. Right. Oh, that's. But I think they were probably quite right not to choose me, uh, and and um, I'm probably much much more pertinent to choose me for the biography possibly but that shouldn't be well, me saying that but i mean john I, I, pearson I think... wrote his biography first and then his fictional biography yeah. later on maybe uh lightning will strike twice i mean i, I do feel that, that 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 uh there's still some mileage in him certainly if i was to advise barbara broccoli who, who would dare do that but i would have thought that you would want to go back and do some of some of the books in period costume, yeah. so to speak. Um, and, you, you know, we want to see what Cuba looks like in 1958, seven or something. Um, yeah. why, why not kind of go back, really? Yeah. And, of and, of and, course, Nicholas, everything is Fleming-centric, but the Bond mythos has continued with, you know, like Seb Fawkes and William Boyd, mm -hmm. who also you sort of know. What is your take on these continuation books and the mythos and... What's your feeling about how it's been extended generally? Well, again, I'm going to have to make a terrible confession. The only one I've read is The King's Lee Amos. Oh, OK, uh, Colonel Sun. Which I, I didn't like very much. OK. And so when I was considering doing, uh, you know, when I was asked to consider yeah. uh, writing a Bond continuation, I didn't read any of the, any of the right. others. Right. I, I reread Bond. So I don't really have a kind of interesting thing to say on the continuation. I mean, one thing I did ask the Brockleys, it struck me that they're so keen on anything Fleming wrote. So why wouldn't they be keen on on the continuation novels, which is what the family had wanted? Yeah. And, you know, I asked them why they hadn't, you know, made any a single. I think one of the things I thought when I if I was going to do the continuation bond, I thought, well, at least they'll, I'll get some money, they'll make a film out of it, little knowing that they haven't made a single film <laughs> out of the continuation. What, what did they say What did they say when you asked them that, why they hadn't I, done that? I, I think they shrugged it off. I think they probably think they don't need to. And um, yeah. But I, it's puzzling, because if you respect, if you respect his, his own storytelling so much, why wouldn't you take take the family's recommendations for people they believe were, were competent to continue it. Mm. I but mean, they have it, used, they have used bits. They did credit Kings the Amos in one of the more recent films for some of the dialogue from Colonel yes, Sanders. Inspector. Yes. I mean, I think okay. you're being far, far, far too modest, Nicholas. I mean, I'm ab absolutely reeling from what you've just revealed that you were asked to, to yeah. approach. And um, having read uh, both this biography, but also the Sandpit, I mean, I would absolutely love to read uh, a james bond novel by you so i i think if they come if they come approaching again i i do hope that they do and i do hope that you will uh, well, that you would do it because it would be fantastic okay. let's hope well, corin well, turner well, and simon ward are listening to this and maybe we can lobby for you okay uh, uh, yeah well, it would be very nice if, if, if you if you suggested that we'll i don't start, think i can suggest it we'll start Nicholas, we'll start the club dust, please dust down your notes of this book and give some other journalists a fantastic scoop yeah uh some, someone else i wanted to mention was uh, sarah gainham who of course was the uh wife of anthony terry who yeah. was a sunday times correspondent and also uh, basically a kind of uh, mi6 asset i think um and she wrote some fantastic uh spy novels in a kind of uh, graham green eric ambler uh mm. vein she features a little bit uh in in your biography but uh, i i know that you read one of her one of her books for it and i, I wondered what you what you made of it i thought it was terrific can you remind me of the title something the, ti Indiana. the tiger the tiger life the Tiger Life. Yeah, um, I thought it was terrific, and I think you—it was you who put me onto it when I read uh, you had written about her. Yeah, and I managed to get a hold of Jonathan. Is it Jonathan Ray, the Spectator wine yeah. correspondent, who who is linked in some way to? He knew her very well, or he's related to her. Yeah, and he was hoping that he had some diaries from her, and so we we you know these are one of the endless tributaries you go you paddle down until you enter mangrove swamps and you can't go any further because i was hoping that suddenly suddenly i was going to find you know her diaries of when ian tried to go to bed with her but she declined probably because um he reminded her too much of her husband yeah uh, 
No, but I thought she was terrific. I thought that novel was, I mean, it's, it's so strange how many good novels uh, we don't hear about. There's, you know, there's so many novels we hear about that aren't any good, but Sarah Gaynham and the other person I've just discovered is a man called, he, he wrote a book called Joanna, Jan, Joanna at Daybreak. And he, he was Booker shortlisted. He's called Hutchinson. And he was selling thousands of copies in the 60s. And he's a wonderful writer. No one's heard of him. These yeah, days. it's uh, sadly very, very common that, isn't it? Uh, I would love them. I think Sarah Gaynham's spy novels are absolutely superb. And I would love for them to come back into print. Um, so I, I, I'm delighted that you enjoyed reading her. Um, I think we've taken quite a lot of your time already, uh, Nicholas. It's been absolutely fantastic and fascinating. I've got nothing to... more to say. You've, you've completely. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna... Can I just show you the view? Um, the view. This is much better. Oh than yes, Golden... please. This is much better than Goldeneye. Look, I'm coming. Oh no, we can't... this the, wow. the South Pole. Wow. The South. This is... I go. I walk down to the beach. It's much better than David Cornwall's house in Cornwall, and <laughs> I'm facing the South Pole. I'm mean, the next landmass is the South Pole. Amazing. Anyway, there's another. There's an eight mile beach in which I walk and there's nobody on it. And um, I eat oysters and drink red wine from the local vineyards. It's extraordinary. And, uh, that, it, so it sounds very Fleming, very Fleming and very Bondian, could I say? Well, I went, I, the only time I went to, to Goldeneye, I helicoptered in with, of all people, Rachel Johnson, a kind of slightly Ursula like Rachel Johnson. And we had lunch <laughs> with Chris Blackwell. And, you know, I thought Goldeneye, frankly, was a kind of, you know, <laughs> Nothing compared with this. I mean, it must have been wonderful in 1946 when Fleming discovered it. But now it's, it, you know, it's like any boutique hotel. It it it, it kind of lacked mm -hmm. a kind of silence. It lacked a, it it lacked a secrecy. Maybe mm. a millionaire record producer will watch this and sort of make you an offer you can't refuse, Nicholas. At the moment, I can refuse most offers if I'm here. <laughs> Except for your <laughs> offer. Except yeah. for your offer. Well, we're me. very, very glad that you uh, that you agreed to to take us up on offer. It's been it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. And there's a huge amount of uh, uh, things that you've told us now, but also a, an enormous yeah. amount of things in this book, which will uh, just as you've gone down many avenues, I'm sure we'll send lots and lots of people down yeah. other avenues in the future. And it's been an absolute pleasure and a delight to talk to you. Well, thank you so much, much, Nicholas, for being so open and generous with your information and time. And uh, all I can say is anyone who is listening, please go out immediately and uh, buy yeah. uh, Ian Fleming, The Complete Man by Nicholas Shakespeare, uh, also buy The Sandpit by Nicholas Shakespeare and all of his other books, um, and uh, hopefully buy a James Bond novel from him coming in the future. <laughs> we, will, we will lobby for that very hard. Um, but yeah, it's been absolutely yes. wonderful. Read, read Fleming. Hopefully the book will encourage you to read Fleming and yeah. the Bond books. You know, the films are great, but they're back into that wonderful world they're all coming out again and uh thanks to nicholas the the, the shakespeare stakes i think as uh kate said at your launch are now to do with you rather than the best selling but you know it's wonderful uh but we will let you uh ha enjoy the rest of your uh evening in your australian paradise and uh, i look forward to seeing your next novel which you're working on now and uh thank you very much thank muchas you gracias muchas, muchas gracias Bye.